This episode was written by Scott Forbes Crawford. Based in Beijing, China, Scott wears a variety of hats as a writer. He recently completed a novel following the adventures of a Roman soldier in ancient China. He is also the co-writer of an action thriller film slated for production next year. For the History Network, Scott previously scripted Season 14, Episode 2, The Battle of Carrie. The History Network.org Podcast, Season 17, Episode 6, The Taiping Rebellion. The clang of gongs hung in the heavy air of an August day, 1860. Waving their yellow flags, the rebels in their red turbans and colourful garb marched closer and closer to Shanghai, until artillery erupted from the city walls and sent them scurrying for cover. Yet the rebels would not fire back. At last they withdrew, scratching their heads that the British and French troops were killing them, not greeting them as Christian brothers for these rebels had been baptised and had no quarrel with the foreigners of Shanghai, and their enemy was the same Chinese government that Anglo-French forces on that same day battled in the north. This episode captures some of the irony and naughtiness of the Taiping Rebellion, pitting an insurgent force of Christianized southern Chinese against the widely resented Qing dynasty. For 14 years the rebellion racked China, causing the death of between 20 and 30 million people, devastation eclipsed only by the Second World War. Though ethnic, economic and other domestic pressures led to the rebellion, it was also a conflict of a rapidly globalising era. Westerners and their faith provided unlikely fuel to the violence, and international trade interests embroiled the European governments, making Britain and France at times the enemy of the Qing, at times its reluctant bedfellows. The Qing China of the mid-19th century was a rickety state. The Qing dynasty ruled an imperial regime composed exclusively of Manchus, an ethnic group from the plains northeast of China that had overgrown the preceding Ming dynasty in 1644. With the fall of the Ming came the end of rule by Han Chinese, the ethnic majority. In the Qing capital of Beijing, segregation confirmed the social order with Manchus residing in a walled inner realm, home to the Forbidden City and Imperial Pleasure Gardens. All others occupied an outer Chinese city. In addition to such segregation, reminders of Manchu dominance came in the form of hairstyle. On pain of death, all Chinese men wore the traditional Manchu queue, shaving the front of the head and growing a long tail in the back, a hated symbol of submission. Many challenges beset Qing during their rule, including multiple uprisings, popular resentment by the majority Hon Chinese and dreadful fiscal health. The dynasty was ill-prepared to meet the demands of European powers, so eager for access to Chinese markets that they would deploy military force to gain them. Britain, in particular, sought a market for opium cultivated in India and found a near limitless one in China. Yet the Chinese showed little interest in other European goods, resulting in a trade imbalance. Tensions around this and the Chinese attempts to stem the opium flow boiled over into the First Opium War of 1839 to 1842. The victorious British compelled a treaty with the Chinese stipulating a war indemnity and the ceding of Hong Kong to Britain, providing Europe a convenient base from which to launch its designs on China. Another key provision established numerous treaty ports within mainland China 
from which Westerners could freely conduct business, predominantly the import of opium and export of tea and silk. Western missionaries also expanded their access to the fertile spiritual ground of a nation with hundreds of millions of souls. Though the Qing imposed harsh measures to keep their subjects in line, subjects whose contempt only grew at the Qing's poor showing against the Europeans, they followed many practices of the preceding dynasty. Mandarin Chinese became the de facto language of government, and the civil service conformed to the Ming-era structure. The Qing also continued the system of imperial examinations, a series of four tests that, if passed, awarded coveted positions into the civil service. Nominally meriocratic, these exams gave Chinese of all ranks a chance to secure prestige and a comfortable future. In reality, years of expensive study and often a healthy bribe were the ticket to passing. In 1827, a boy in southern China, Hong Shu Chuen, passed the first round of his imperial examinations. Born in 1813, Hong hailed from a once proud family, hoping to restore its place through the boy. His relatives squeezing the coffers to pay his education, Hong dedicated himself to study and memorised the Confucian classic texts that were the foundation of the tests. He passed the second examination, only to fail the third. While in the city of Guangzhou, for another crack at it in 1833, Hong met a Chinese member of the London Bible Society in the streets and received translated Christian tracts from him. After failing the exam again, Hong carried the materials back home, gave them a glance, and then tucked them away to be forgotten. After yet another attempt at the exams in 1836, Hong suffered a nervous collapse and experienced a vision. A grand procession of men in finery and all manner of creatures whisked him off in a sedan chair to a splendid palace. There a surgeon cut out Hong's heart and replaced it with a new one. Hong continued on and was received by the master of this palace, an old man robed in black with a long golden beard who urged Hong to slay demons and presented him with a great sword. Next Hong met a middle-aged man whom he called Elder Brother. Hong returned to consciousness only for his elaborate visions to persist for the next forty days. When they ended, he had no sense of their meaning, but in 1843 Hong stumbled upon the Christian literature he had received years earlier, and in it he found the key to decipher his visions. The man in the robe could only be God, the elder brother, Jesus Christ, making Hong the younger brother of Christ. Hong identified the demons God had urged him to slay as those false idols of Chinese culture, Confucianism, Buddhism and Taoism. A new destiny unfolded before the failed scholar. I have received the immediate command from God in his presence. The will of heaven rests with me, proclaimed Hong. Although thereby I should meet with calamity, difficulties and suffering, yet I am resolved to act. Baptising first members of his family and village, and then becoming an itinerant preacher, Hong established the Society of God Worshippers. As he built congregations around southern China, he destroyed the temples and graven images of traditional Chinese beliefs. His flock quickly swelled for a number of reasons. An 1850 plague sped the sick to him in the belief that Hong's God might heal them. He espoused a system of communal property ownership which greatly appealed to struggling farmers. 
In great contrast to mainstream Chinese society, women enjoyed equal rights, and the classless society he offered broke from Chinese tradition, which afforded scant upward mobility. In addition, many early Society of God members were, like Hong, members of the Hoka, or guest people, an ethnically Hon minority group with its own language who had arrived recently to the area and faced discrimination by the established residents. Hong's rhetoric soon grew increasingly anti-Manchu and he saw his mission as driving the corrupt Qing from rule or at least ridding the region of them. The spark that would ignite this clash came through an outbreak of violence between the Hoka and the established Hon of the region. The Hoka sought refuge with the Society of God worshippers. In response, the Qing government dispatched soldiers to round up Hong and his troublemakers. Society of God worshippers members rose up to prevent this, attacking the startled Qing troops and gaining their first victory. The time had come for Hong to step up his operations. He gathered his far-flung congregations. Others also heard his summons. More Hoka, other oppressed minority groups, triads, anti-Manchu secret societies, bandits, the impoverished and disaffected, a motley array united by both a hatred of the Qing and their conversion to Hong's brand of Old Testament Christianity mutated by his own divine revelations. The rebels became known as long hairs for growing their shaved heads in defiance of Qing policy. On January 11th, 1851, Hong founded the Taiping Tian Guo, the heavenly kingdom of great peace, naming himself its heavenly king. Its military formed rapidly, A general commanded each army of 13,270 men split into five divisions. Early in the war, female armies led by female officers saw action, but later on faded from the battlefield. While the Taiping troops often lacked training and individual effectiveness, a steady flow from the countryside filled depleted ranks and formed new armies. As a result, Taiping armies often held a numerical advantage over their imperial foes. The Qing military was cobbled from a range of elements into a rather chaotic whole. Ethnically Manchu armies and Mongolian cavalry concentrated in the north, their underlying purpose to protect the regime. The army of the Green Standard, composed of Hon Chinese, made up the primary fighting force, but they were poorly armed, poorly trained, and generally under strength. Later in the war, a provincial militia, the Hunan army, entered the war. It was commanded by a civil official, Tsieng Guo Fan, unschooled and uninterested in military command, yet dogged and able to learn from some early blunders, such as losing an entire flotilla of ships in an action in 1854. Unlike the lacklustre imperial forces poorly motivated to serve their Manchu masters, Tseng built his army from men of the same villages and region, fostering esprit de corps, and he richly rewarded his men for performance. The Hunan army would prove among the most effective imperial units of the war. Qing fears about the loyalty of ethnically Hon armies doubtlessly undermined their coordination and effectiveness. The Taiping and imperial soldiers carried similar armaments, including matchlock rifles, jingals, large boar rifles, typically fired from a mount, spears, swords, bows and arrows, and farming tools. Later in the war, western firearms purchased from foreign traders became more common on the battlefield. On both sides, field artillery was limited, though cities often possessed cannon. 
a shortage of arms bedevilled both belligerents. Warfare occurred almost exclusively in mountainous southern China, primarily in the valley of the Yangtze River, China's great east-west waterway and vital conduit of both trade and troop movements. Much of the fighting took the form of sieges, and the temperamental firearms and preponderance of soldiers armed with melee weapons meant much close-quarter fighting. Policies on both sides of giving no quarter gave scant inducement to surrender. In the first two years of the rebellion, the Taiping enjoyed a series of military successes against the Qing in southern China. Remaining constantly on the move upon storming towns and cities, they would generally massacre the Manchu population and spare the Hon, and then move on to their next target. By foregoing the possession of territory, they held the initiative, able to nimbly outmanoeuvre their lumbering foes. At this time, the Taiping objective was to secure southern China and establish a rival kingdom that could perhaps coexist with a second northern kingdom, still governed by the Qing, from Beijing. In March 1853, the Taiping marched on the city of Nanjing, the heavily fortified first capital of the Ming dynasty. With many seasoned coal miners in their ranks, the Taiping army mined the wall while another unit forced a gate. When the rebels stormed in, the garrison of imperial soldiers scattered. The Taiping executed the Manchu residents to a man and demolished the city's ancient Confucian, Taoist and Buddhist temples. Capturing Nanjing carried great symbolic weight. Hong proclaimed Nanjing the capital of the Taiping Kingdom, a site placing Hong within the lineage of the Ming Dynasty, implicitly standing as a champion of China's ethnically Hon majority. The heavenly king installed himself in a grand palace. Below him stood lesser kings of the four directions, eastern king, western king, and so forth, who served as his ministers. Strict laws controlled daily life. Men and women were segregated, including husbands and wives. Opium use was strictly prohibited on pain of beheading. This severe Taiping policy on opium would later cause much consternation among the Western business interests in China. On the face of it, the seizure of a grand Chinese city might appear merely a great step forward in a victorious trajectory, yet here perhaps the Taiping gravely faltered. Establishing a Taiping state profoundly shifted the political tenor of the rebellion. Augustus Lindley, an Englishman who had served with the Taiping army, observed, So long as the movement in the earlier stages of patriotic excitement was looked upon as a means of overthrowing the foreign dynasty, it was a national and a popular one. But as the foreign-derived religious character transpired, the Chinese naturally began to eye with suspicion a movement so vast, aiming not only at the subversion of the reigning dynasty, but of the time-honoured superstitions, ceremonies and faith of the nation. Perhaps more critically, the new political reality caused the Taiping military strategy to about-face. Hitherto, the Taiping had remained a highly mobile insurgent force. By halting the momentum of the rebellion, they surrendered the initiative that had kept the Qing in a reactive state from the beginning. It is widely believed that had the Taiping immediately marched north and attacked Beijing, the Qing dynasty would have fallen. Instead, the stalled Taiping advance enabled the Qing to regroup and even reoccupy towns and cities previously conquered by the rebels. And by switching to a defensive posture, the Taiping presented the Imperials with a static target, and one that would take resources to defend. As the Qing armies strengthened, they converged on Nanjing and began squeezing it through siege. In the following years, Taiping forces in the field often had to abandon their objectives in order to rush back to thin the enemy ranks and clear the city's lines 
Perhaps flush with their victory in Nanjing, the Taiping objective changed. No longer would they settle for an autonomous southern kingdom. The Qing must fall, and the Taiping would bring the fight to them. The military split into three, one faction to defend Nanjing, another to secure strongholds in the Yangtze River Valley, and the third to march on Beijing. This small force, its number isn't known, but likely fewer than 20,000, set out in May 1843. Fighting their way north, they reached the outskirts of the northern city of Tianjin, a mere few days' march from Beijing. But there the imperial forces surrounded the rebels. Digging in, the Taiping soldiers could do little more than watch as the enemy lines thickened and fieldworks sprung up against them. Devastated by combat and the fierce winter the southern rebels were unaccustomed to, after three months the Taiping made a brazen escape, fighting their way out. Harried for months by their pursuers, the Taiping force at last linked up with the Taiping reserves in the south, only for this army to be at last annihilated. Taiping fortunes continued darkening in the mid-1850s. Though Nanjing held against frequent sieges, in 1854 imperial actions drove the rebels from some of their Yangtze Valley strongholds, forcing retreat to the capital. In 1856, Yang Shuqing, the Taiping's eastern king, proclaimed his own divine visions to rival Hongs and attempted a coup. The coup was put down and Yang was slain, along with 20,000 of his soldiers, a loss of strength the Taiping could ill afford. Following the coup, the kingdom became riven by factionalism and distrust. New blood would revitalise the rebellion, perhaps largely because that blood was of the Heavenly King's own line. In 1859, Hong Ren Gan, the Heavenly King's cousin, after several failed attempts to cross imperial lines, at last reached Nanjing. A Christian, Hong Ren Gan, had travelled to Hong Kong, where he became a British missionary's assistant, enabling him to master English and gain perspective on Western ways. Left paranoid in the wake of the failed coup against him, Hong Tzu Kwan promptly named his cousin the Shield King and made him the Taiping Prime Minister. Hong Ren Gan's vision for Taiping victory depended heavily on Western assistance and he immediately emphasised building relations with the European powers in China. If only the Taiping could win Western allies, modern weaponry and the latest steamships with which the Taiping might control the Yangtze River, the tide could turn. Hong Ren Gan, reasonably believing that his own background among Europeans and the professed Christianity of the Taiping would form a natural bridge to them, so the Taiping armies began pushing toward Shanghai, vigilantly avoiding any harm to foreigners or foreign interests where they might encounter them. From the time of Earl George McCartney's refusal to kowtow before the Emperor in 1793, Britain and other European governments had a fitful relationship with the Qing. As China's economic importance as the source of tea, silk and spice and the consumer of opium grew, the British government struggled with how best to ensure the long-term stability of its trade. To many, establishing another colony like India seemed a costly burden, particularly when the dangers of empire were underscored by the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857. And so Britain resolved itself to prop up the Qing regime in order to keep trade flowing, a resolution that even open warfare would not break. For hostilities erupted in 1856 between the Qing and Britain, France and to a lesser extent the United States. The four-year Second Opium War closely echoed the First Opium War, with the Chinese suffering a humiliating defeat, followed by an onerous treaty. 
Despite such a rocky state of affairs with the Chinese government, the British worried far more about the effect of a Taiping-ruled China on trade. The Taiping's strident position on opium helped fire those fears. As the rebels neared Shanghai by the day, wild rumours about atrocities spread among the foreigners. In fact, when the Taiping seized the treaty port city of Ningbo, about 140 kilometres or 90 miles south of Shanghai, in December of 1861, the rebels went to great lengths to harm neither foreigners nor their property or business interests. Nevertheless, a perception of endangered trade prevailed among Western business concerns. Not all Westerners in China sought their fortune in tea, silk or opium. A young sailor from Massachusetts, Frederick Townsend Ward, was a soldier of fortune who learnt his trade as a mercenary in Mexico and Central America and by serving in the French army in the Crimean War. Arriving in Shanghai in 1860, Ward, backed by wealthy Chinese merchants, founded the Shanghai Foreign Arms Corps, a force primarily of Americans, British and Filipinos. His performance at first spotty, losing many men in his first engagement, Ward improved over time, especially with the addition of artillery, steamships and Chinese soldiers. Likely to lure more Chinese in, his outfit was later given the grandiose name of the ever-victorious army. Though quick to defend its immediate interests, Britain continued clinging to a policy of neutrality, but then another civil war forced its hand. The outbreak of the United States Civil War in 1861 gutted the key American market, which purchased tea and manufactured goods from Britain in great quantity. Fearful of losing both markets, Britain had to act to safeguard its Chinese enterprise. British arms and gunships found their way into the Qing armies. British troops fighting under the Chinese emperor was a bridge too far, but after Frederick Townsend Ward's death in 1862, Charles Chinese Gordon, later to become the hero of Khartoum, took command of the ever-victorious army while on detached service from the Crown, a fig leaf to maintain British neutrality. Working in conjunction with a Chinese commander, Gordon's leadership led to quick triumphs for the ever-victorious army. Buoyed by this and by foreign material support, the Qing now rallied and, after years of disjointed actions, moved in lockstep. Severing Nanjing's lines of communication, the imperial armies tightened the siege the Taiping capital had been weathering for years. Circled with trenches and earthworks, the city was being squeezed. Yet Nanjing was a tough nut to crack. Walls too thick to be pierced by cannon kept it shielded, and an array of forts in its surrounding hills further strengthened it. In mountainous terrain and on the banks of the Yangtze River, cutting the city off entirely was a daunting task. But with Taiping armies no longer able to pressure the Imperials in the field, soldiers now flooded into the lines of besiegers. By constructing lengthy siege walls and capturing the forts most critical to Nanjing's defence, the Imperials at last managed to completely seal off the city from resupply or escape. With the Taiping trapped, the Imperials focused on tunnelling and undermining the walls. Though the defenders would dig counter mines and were able to kill some Imperial sappers by poisoning the mine with gas, the siege came inexorably on and Nanjing's fall was only a matter of time. Yet, even so, the Heavenly King refused to quit the city, and Hong would not live to see his capital fall. On June the 1st, 1864, Hong died of food poisoning 
or some illness. Knowing no mercy awaited them outside the city walls, the besieged held fast. Launching a mighty naval attack on Nanjing's forts on the banks of the Yangtze River, the Imperials now controlled the river, with control of other forts in Nanjing's environs and through the construction of immense siege works, the imperial forces could shoot freely into the city and provide covering fire for their sappers as they dug a gargantuan mine. Packing the mine with gunpowder, they blasted through the wall on July the 19th, an explosion so mighty it killed hundreds of imperial troops poised to storm the city. Amid the wide slaughter that followed, the Imperials captured the remaining Taiping kings and generals. Those who managed to escape were quickly hunted down and put to death. Though a small Taiping resistance still smouldered in the following years, the rebellion that had nearly brought a 200-year-old dynasty to its knees was at last smothered out. The Taiping Rebellion stood as a harbinger of the modern wars yet to come, certainly in the totality of its violence as the second most destructive war in history. Even more so, it provoked interconnected global actors to take stern measures to ensure the stability of trade. Nations oceans away would now enter distant battlefields and influence the course of a domestic conflict. As the Taiping discovered, not even a common enemy and a shared faith could make allies of the West. Too late did the rebels learn that they were seen as little more than a danger to the true European interests in China. If you'd like to help support us at the History Network, then you could write a script just as Scott did for this episode. Or if that's not your style, then there's a donate button at the website. Or perhaps one of our previous seasons would interest you. These are available from the store for just a couple of pounds each. Even just an email with suggestions for podcast subjects is a help, and we love to hear from you whatever it is you want to get in touch about. So you can do so by dropping a line to info at thehistorynetwork.org. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast, written by Scott Forbes Crawford, read by Nick Barker.